Hello, Internet. In ancient Greek mythology, Hephaestus was regarded as the god of the forge. With skills in sculpting, metalwork, fire, and volcanoes, he was the blacksmith of Mount Olympus who crafted iconic weapons and accessories. Hephaestus was one of the most creative gods, influencing humans and gods alike. One of his well-known creations was that of the first female human, Pandora, which he made at the behest of Zeus. He was also linked closely to the story of Prometheus, who stole fire from the forge of Hephaestus to give to man. The chains used to punish Prometheus, bounding him to the Caucasus Mountains, were also forged by Hephaestus. The shield of Achilles, the helmet and sandals of Hermes, the arrows of Artemis and Eros, Hercules' breastplate, Apollo's golden chariot, Poseidon's trident, and many more were all made by the god of the forge. Steel and various metallic alloys are hands down the most important materials of our collective history. They have been the skeleton of human industry for centuries, and the advent of the method to mass produce steel from iron ore was the impetus to transform human society from a mostly agricultural lifestyle to urban industrialization. Metal forms the backbone of our skyscrapers. It paves the way for our railways. It moves cargo across vast oceans. It shapes the engines that power our society. It has allowed us to send humans to space, and the very tools that forge these objects are also made of steel. Of the 118 elements on the periodic table, around 95 of those elements are metals, or likely to be metals. The uncertainty is due to a lack of universally accepted consensus of the categories of metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Iron is also an essential element for blood production in the body. A large percentage of the iron in our blood is found in a red blood cell protein molecule known as hemoglobin, and iron is also found in our muscle cell protein, myoglobin. The iron-rich hemoglobin is essential for transferring the oxygen in your blood from the lungs to tissues, organs, and our brains. Iron is not produced in the body and must be absorbed from foods rich in iron, such as meats, fruits, and vegetables. A lack of iron in the body or iron deficiency anema means your body cannot produce hemoglobin and get oxygen where it needs to go. All that said, metals are undoubtedly the most important materials on Earth. Without them, complex carbon-based life does not exist. Thomas Eager is a professor who works at the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I feel that he explains the difficulty and importance of manipulating metal best. The complexity of welding is readily apparent when one considers that fusion welding involves temperature gradients of thousands of degrees over distances of less than a centimeter occurring on the time scale of seconds involving multiple phases of solids, liquids, gases, and plasma. Indeed, this complexity causes most scientists to shun welding as unscientific and unworthy of thoughtful analysis. It is only the true engineer who is willing to deal with a process of such exceeding complexity in order to achieve the end result of a fabricated product of commercial and societal usefulness. One of the challenges facing those who engineer welded structures and components is communication of the importance and significance of welding to other scientists and to the general public. Unfortunately, it's painful to admit that the vast majority of welders don't care about the trade whatsoever. They don't care about the science, what they produce, or why their job is important to society. Welders, much like myself, are typically non-college educated men. Most of us are simply in it for the paycheck, and not much beyond that. But there are a small group of welders that are obsessed with what they do and learn the ins and outs of every component they touch. When a welder puts thought behind the skill, their mindset changes entirely. Welders, as well as other craftspeople, must be able to think materially about material goods. Critical thinking, or lack thereof, 
is the difference between a welder that is moving towards mastery of their skill or just some dude doing the bare minimum to get a paycheck. The ability to think critically gives craftspeople some independence from the manipulation of propaganda. Marketing diverts the mind to a nonsensical backstory initiated through associations, but a true craftsperson is more concerned with what a thing is. Knowledge of the production narrative, or at the very least the ability to conceptualize it, renders the social narrative of propaganda less potent. For example, the Green New Deal puts forth a social narrative as being better for the environment when it comes to energy production. However, those of us concerned with the production narrative know that deforestation and burning down trees is not better for the environment. The mindset of a true tradesperson is somewhat of an impoverished fantasy life compared to that of the ideal consumer. They are more utilitarian and less swayed by unrealistic hopes and ideas. They tend to be guided more by their individual moral compass rather than by desire. Welding, like other skilled trades, requires a systematic understanding of the material world. Ben Shapiro is known for the phrase, facts don't care about your feelings, and those words take on an entirely new meaning in terms of building. Good tradespeople are extremely disciplined, and their knowledge is not spoon-fed to them in a classroom, but acquired through thoughtful perception and a logical approach to scientific problems. In fact, in many areas of well-developed trade, technological advancements from craftspeople come first, and scientific understanding and theory come second. Pierre Vernier was a French engineer that worked on cartography and surveying. While uh, working, he developed an instrument to aid in quick and accurate measurements in his publication, La Construction, L'Usage et les Propriétés du Quadrant Nouveau de Mathématiques. Sorry, I butchered that. It means construction, use, and properties of the new mathematical quadrant. Vernier describes his invention that is used pretty much in every shop and garage on the planet, the Vernier caliper. It is an instrument for accurately measuring length to a thousandth of an inch. Vernier's invention is an everyday example of a moment in which a skilled craftsman made explicit the assumptions that are implicit to his manual skill. During the French National Convention, a timeless phrase was used that is as true today as it was over 200 years ago. Il doit bon envisager qu'une grande responsabilité est la suite inseparable d'un grand pouvoir. Translation. They must consider that great responsibility is inseparable from great power. Or you probably know it better from the late Stanley Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. Hephaestus not only made thrones and palaces for the gods, but he also made their weapons and other devices that can be used to cause harm or destruction. Sometimes the act of creating one thing involves the destruction of another. Welders know the tools that are necessary to cut metal, and we know what to look for in terms of structural weak points on metal objects. That means if a welder can build a safe, one can most certainly destroy the door and gain access. <clears throat> now, I'm not advising theft, but let's play the what-if game. If one was going to break into a small safe, there are a few factors to consider and many tools at their disposal. When electricity is re readily available, I've seen footage of people getting into safes with a simple anger angle grinder that you could buy at Home Depot. With enough cutting discs, as long as sound, sparks, and police response time aren't a factor, just about any safe in existence can be cracked open with little to no skill. If there is electricity and you need to cut through quickly, a plasma cutter is another option, if you carry in compressed air. That takes a little bit more skill and thought so you don't damage the contents on the inside. A large vault? That'll take research, but an industrial magnetic drill and well-placed well shape charges targeted at the vault's weak points will probably do the trick. If there's no electricity available and you have the skill to use it properly, an oxyacetylene torch from Home Depot and enough gas can cut through thick steel like butter. Or if you need to be light and discreet, 
you can make a thermal lance with oxygen, a steel brake line, and steel wool to ignite the lance and cut through steel with that. Many robberies where the valuable item is locked using steel, some sort of industrial cutting tool is typically used as the master key. The tool changes depending on the circumstance and skill of the criminal. Metalworking skills can be used to break into things, but those skills can also be used to make absolutely devastating weapons platforms that can literally bring an entire town to its knees and leave the police powerless to do anything but run and hide. In 2004, a reasonable man was pushed to do unreasonable things. He was a welder, and his name was Marvin Hemeyer. Hemeyer was a man who pretty much single-handedly destroyed an entire town in Granby, Colorado. One disgruntled welder destroyed an entire town. Let that sink in. When he went on his rampage around town, he used a modified bulldozer commonly referred to as the Killdozer. The armor was over a foot thick in certain areas, and he used a combination of thick tool steel and concrete to create something pretty much impervious to anything the police or even a platoon of marines for that matter could throw at him. The thickness of the tool steel combined with the concrete can easily stop a 50 caliber armor piercing round and explosives. Even a rocket propelled grenade cannot penetrate that kind of armor because those shape charges are designed to pierce through metal. But once it hits the concrete in Hemeyer's custom armor, even those won't be effective. Same thing with an AT4 anti-tank weapon. Those can punch through thick steel, but would probably not penetrate concrete. Oh, and with all that armor, Hemeyer also installed fans and an air conditioner to keep the driver nice and cool, so he probably didn't even break a sweat. During the rampage, he destroyed the town hall, the local newspaper, the home of a judge, a concrete factory, a hardware store, and many other buildings uh, targeting those he believed wronged him. In total, he leveled 13 buildings, causing about $7 million in damage, but he did not harm a single human life. Police and SWAT teams fired countless rounds at the killdozer with zero effect. They climbed on top and threw a flashbang into the exhaust, which did nothing. They even brought out another large tractor to uh, try and fight the killdozer, but Hemeyer just pushed it out of the way. The governor of Colorado at the time even considered calling in an attack Apache helicopter armed with Hellfire missiles to take out the Killdozer, which would have worked, however, that plan was quickly abandoned. You see, firing missiles in an American town is a bad idea because the collateral damage would likely be greater than the threat itself. The only thing that stopped Hemeyer was the radiator was damaged and the Killdozer got stuck in debris. Once he couldn't get out, Hemeyer took his own life the only casualty in the incident. Police tried to use explosives to open the armor, but failed three times. They eventually used an oxyacetylene torch to cut through the armor and get inside. Now, what Marvin Hemeyer did was wrong regardless of his reasons. However, his ingenuity is nothing short of amazing. He is probably the only person in human history that had an entire town at his mercy and there was absolutely nothing anyone could have done to stop him other than wait till he ran out of gas. Intelligence like that is what wins wars. When it comes to welding, you can build homes, bridges, aircraft components, and things that ultimately help society, but in the wrong hands, the skills and knowledge of a welder can be devastating. Lesson, don't steal, don't go on a rampage with a bulldozer, <laughs> and it's probably not wise to piss off a welder. The average person outside of industry typically has no clue that many disciplines fall under the umbrella of welding. Submerged arc welding is a process where a a weld is shielded in a bed of flux. Friction stir welding, metals are fused together with friction, pressure, and rotation. Then there's laser beam welding that uses a laser rather than an electrical current as a heat source. There's even explosion welding where completely dissimilar metals can be fused together with sheer velocity. And the list goes on. 
The most common specialties taught in school are typically five processes, but uh, one is slowly disappearing in industry. The first of those processes is oxy-fuel welding that uses a combination of oxygen and acetylene to produce a flame which is hot enough to melt metal. This process has its applications but is slowly fading away. Some welding schools no longer have it as a required welding course and focus on metal cutting with the torch only. The next two processes that are widely used in shops all over the country are gas metal arc welding, commonly referred to as MIG, and flux core welding, also known as flux. These are wire feed processes and, a, and they're considered um, semi-automatic since the welder doesn't have to feed the wire themselves. They are different but also so similar that most decent wire feed welding machines can do both of these processes. MIG welding requires the use of a gas to shield or protect the weld from oxygen in the environment, typically carbon dioxide or an argon carbon dioxide mix. Flux core welding can either be gas shielded to protect the weld or the process can be used without gas and a flux inside the core of the wire produces a gas which shields and protects the weld, hence the name flux core. MIG and flux do take skill to master but tend to be the best starting point for students and hobbyists because the gun can be manipulated with both hands making it a bit easier to control. Shielded metal arc welding more commonly known as stick welding, is a manual welding process that definitely takes time and effort to do well. Out of the electrical welding processes, shielded metal arc welding is the most simple in terms of equipment, not requiring complex machines to feed wire and no shielding gas is necessary. The welds in this process are protected from atmosphere by the flux coating on the welding rods. The last and arguably most difficult manual welding process is tungsten inert gas welding, also known as TIG welding. This process primarily uses argon gas to shield the weld or a helium argon mix. A tungsten electrode is used to bring the base metal to welding temperatures and material is added manually with the opposite hand. This process is difficult because it takes quite a bit of dexterity in both hands and the arc is initiated by a foot pedal, so control is also needed there as well. All of the electric welding processes do the same thing. They fuse metal together. However, each process has its strengths and weaknesses depending on what you need to accomplish. In the short period of time that I taught welding, an exercise I would use to help students better understand the application of each process was to name a product or situation and have a discussion on which process would work best. Say you're in the middle of nowhere and you need to weld something. No electricity is available and no generators are available. Oxyacetylene welding is pretty much your only option. If you lug out a bunch of batteries and connect them in sequence, you'll be able to stick weld. If money is not a factor, the company Fronius makes a battery-operated stick welding machine. How about a repair on farming equipment that broke down on your property and you do have a generator? You could drag a wire feed machine out there, but that would be complex and bulky. If it's windy outside, MIG won't work well because your gas will be blowing in the wind. Maybe the stick welding process would be the best solution because the machine is simple and easy to set up and can work in the wind. What if you're manufacturing vehicle exhausts? If you want to mass produce them and maximize on profits and limit labor time, MIG welding is the way to go. However, if you're making a high-end Inconel exhaust for a Formula One race car, TIG welding would be the better option to use on a super alloy. What if you wanted to weld on galvanized coated materials? Well, ideally you'd want to use flux core or stick welding because those processes are better suited for welding through galvanized and galvanized material and reduce the likelihood of porosity or defective welds. In the end, what process you use depends on weather conditions, if outside, the material being welded and how thick that material is, if it's mass production, manufacturing, or a custom job in a small shop, cost, safety, physical access to the area that needs to be welded, and many other factors. Simply put, if you're willing to work, welding is guaranteed food on your table. The skill set is fairly pandemic proof and essential. Welding is also apocalypse proof because if you survive the end of the world, welders are one of the necessary pieces to put vital infrastructure back together. Personally, I have been, not been welding for a very long time in terms of years. 
I started welding school in 2016 and got my first job two weeks after I finished in 2017. However, when it comes to judging the skill of a welder, it's best to judge them by how many hours they've worked and their ability to solve new problems. There are plenty of welders out there that are one-trick ponies that really only work for a couple of hours of their shift and they're screwing off the other six. From what I've seen in the field, skill beats experience the majority of the time. Experience does matter if the task is a trade secret or if the welding procedure is complex, but ex an experienced welder compared to a welder with more skill tends to be slower if both are put on an unfamiliar task. One aerospace company I worked for in Valencia was a revolving door. Pipe welders with decades of experience would come in weekly and either fail the weld test or quit within a week if they were hired. You can have all the experience in the world welding thick material, but when you're asked to TIG weld wires as thin as a human hair, a welder with no experience can potentially learn faster because they have no bad habits. I may not have many years in industry, I may not have any welding certifications, but I have worked at some of the largest companies in America. The materials I've welded thus far are carbon steel, tool steel, galvanized steel, stainless steel, cast iron, Hasseloy, Inconel, titanium, brass, aluminum, Hanes, and other less common metals used to manufacture thermocouples. In California, my first job was at Virico Manufacturing, making hundreds of chairs a day. Then I moved on to ASC Process Systems and learned about industrial ovens. I left that job and landed my first aerospace gig at Senior Aerospace SSP, where the training with various super alloys brought my TIG welding to an expert level practically overnight. There I welded ink and L components for the Airbus A380. I made lighting fixtures at Lucive Decor, aerospace temperature sensors at Harco Semco, turbine blades at Capstone Turbine, military aircraft components at Honeywell Aerospace, military ground support equipment at Hydraulics International, and therapeutic whirlpool tubs at Whitehall Manufacturing. When I lived in Vegas, I taught welding at the College of Southern Nevada. At Q Corporation, I welded more aluminum there in a month than most welders see in their entire careers. I welded turbo manifolds at IROS Motorsports at the Las Vegas Speedway. I fabricated aluminum cabanas for the Disneyland Star Wars rides at AMC Fabrication, made signage at the graphic design company Supercolor Digital, manufactured agricultural products for the cannabis industry at Green Bros, and welded titanium components for prototype military weaponry at Rocky Research Facility. I recently moved to Texas, and I'm currently working at a great company right now. When I started looking for welding work in this state, I knew nobody, Nobody knew me, and I got a job two miles from my apartment after about a day of looking. That's 17 different welding jobs from 2017 to 2020, with probably a few more I've forgotten. In my short career, I've used all five welding processes between all of these jobs. My specialty is TIG welding, thin super alloys, and I'm extremely good at that process, but still have a lot to learn. When it comes to improvement, if you have good problem-solving skills, understand the chemistry and physics of welding, you're willing to put in the work and refine your manual competency, the job potential is limitless. Welding is probably one of the best things that has ever happened to me personally in my life. Getting paid to play with fire and electricity is challenging, oddly therapeutic, and can be a lot of fun. Sure, there are times when mistakes are made and you're screaming at an inanimate object, but for the most part, I love this trade. Welding is obviously not for everyone, and a lot of people quit at various stages. <clears throat> when I was in school, many students would drop once labs started due to burns, cuts, smoke, and wearing all the heavy, sweaty gear. As a teacher, I saw students drop because they couldn't pass written exams. Others quit welding while working. They would use the trade to get into a company and just not weld once they got there. A select few quit to open their own businesses, and they'll hire other welders to do the welding for them. The thing I dislike most about welding is that people think of this trade as more of an art than a science. 
Welders may not know how to explain the properties of an atom, but we use many of the metals and gases on the periodic table to build objects that everyone from school teachers to doctors depend on to survive. People assume that welding is not scientific largely because they think any manual labor is just brainless grunt work, and few welders have the ability to explain the complexities of our trade. British mathematician William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin, once said, I often say that when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely, in your thoughts, advanced to a state of science, whatever the matter may be. That is largely why welding is considered an art and not a science. Unfortunately, that may remain so because to master welding takes decades and to master the science probably just as long. The dangers of welding remaining in art is that the trade secrets die with those of us who weld. Take the Saturn V rocket, for example, that put men on the moon. Recently, engineers attempted to recreate the rocket and failed miserably. They had 3D scanners, additive manufacturing, old prints, and a wealth of information at their disposal, but could not recreate old rocket technology. That is because these Saturn V rockets were built by the hands of skilled tradesmen, something computers and more advanced technology cannot replicate. The Saturn V rockets are similar to the Great Pyramids of Giza in that regard. We can study them, but modern engineers have zero clue how to build them because that knowledge died with the craftsmen. There are currently about 400,000 welders in the United States, which means that we make up less than 0.1% of the American population. There are twice as many doctors as welders, and the last time I checked, a doctor cannot practice medicine without the infrastructure people like welders provide. Many citizens cannot survive without natural gas pipelines that welders work on. The trains, shipping containers, aircraft components, firefighting equipment, oil platforms, military defense, etc. Welders are not the heroes of society, but like Hephaestus, what we produce is used by practically everyone. Our trade is slowly disappearing for various reasons, and I don't think that will be good for the future of humanity, for such knowledge to be lost. But hey, that's my take on that. Peace.